Once Around, Anti-Stars. So this was something that hit the news recently, and I just wanted to talk about it. We should start by saying some words about matter and antimatter. Everything that we see around us in the ordinary course of our existence is made of ordinary matter with atoms made with positively charged nuclei and clouds of electrons orbiting round them. But there is another kind of matter out there, very rare in the common world, called antimatter, which is the mirror opposite, where the nuclei are negatively charged, containing antiprotons, and the anti-electrons, which we also call positrons, they have their own name because they're so important, are orbiting around, creating anti-atoms. And we would call an anti-atom with one proton, one anti-proton in the centre, and one anti-electron, positron, orbiting around it, an anti-hydrogen atom. But you can create heavier anti-atoms, Next would be anti-helium, and then anti-lithium, and so on. In theory, all such things are possible. And it would be very, very hard to tell the difference by looking at them, because the orbits of the positrons would be the same as the orbits of the electrons in the ordinary matter, and the energy levels would be identical, and the transitions between them would be identical, and so the light, the photons of light, would have the same energy, frequency, and wavelength. It would be impossible to tell remotely which you were looking at. Um, now, we have managed to make some of these in particle accelerators. We're certainly quite good these days at making anti-hydrogen, and we've even made some anti-helium in the latest results from some of the particle colliders. Now, antimatter is also famous, of course, for being able to annihilate with ordinary matter. You get matter and antimatter together and they will cancel each other out and release their entire mass energy in a burst of gamma radiation via the equation E equals mc squared. So all the mass m of both particles is converted into pure energy. Uh, so if you had some antimatter, it would be a tremendous source of power and energy, uh, a great fuel for a starship, perhaps, and also uh, a terrific way of making a very dangerous bomb. So uh, perhaps it's good that we don't have very much of it. When that happens, particularly with electrons and positrons, anti-electrons annihilating with each other, you get a very specific amount of energy because the total mass of both particles is converted into energy. You get 511 kilo electron volts. An electron volt is the amount of energy that an electron would gain accelerating across a potential of a volt. And you get 500,000 of those if you turn a pair of electron and anti-electrons into pure energy, destroying all their mass and releasing it as, as pure energy. And the diagram on the right is our galaxy spread out across the sky in a whole range of different wavelengths. And it's a very interesting way of looking at it, from 21 centimeter hydrogen radio waves through to gamma rays. And in the center, the 511 kilo electron volt gamma ray uh, emissions much of which is coming from that very centre of the galaxy, and that is associated with the uh, material in and around the very hot region where the supermassive black hole in the centre of our Milky Way resides. But there are other hot spots throughout the galaxy as well, as we shall see, and indeed across the whole of the universe. Now, because... It, uh, we can take uh, matter and antimatter, annihilate it, and produce gamma rays. And because the E equals mc squared equation works both ways round, you can actually take a pair of gamma ray photons and smash them together, and out you get an electron and a positron, an anti-electron. 
and we do that in particle accelerators and cosmic rays do it in the upper atmosphere all the time when they hit uh, atoms this process creates a shower of electrons and positrons coming down from the sky which then have further interactions so we're, we're quite good at being able to do this and it's been well understood since it was first predicted back in around 1930 when Paul Dirac was staring into the, his fireplace here in Cambridge and came up with his famous Dirac equation which predicted the existence of antimatter. So it works both ways. You can use energy to make matter and you can use matter and antimatter to combine them to get your energy back again. But in the Big Bang, we had, we think, pure energy to begin with. And now we have a whole load of matter. So what happened? Well, we think that the energy was converted into matter by energy particles, photons, crashing into each other and creating pairs of particles, matter and antimatter. But you should have had equal amounts, equal numbers of particles and antiparticles. So how come we seem to have ended up in a world made of matter and that there isn't much antimatter around? Well, it's thought that maybe there was a small asymmetry and that it's as if one extra matter particle was left over for every billion pairs of matter-antimatter particles that were created and that the majority of that billion re-annihilated back into energy um, and we think that because of the ratio of matter to photon energy flying around the universe uh, as we can measure in terms of things like the cosmic microwave background radiation we think that the matter is just a tiny leftover of one part in a billion of the total energy that was in the Big Bang itself so all it would take is that one in a billion unsymmetrical nature to manage to create the extra matter now various particle physics experiments and so forth have been done and we have measured some small asymmetries but the numbers still don't quite add up right so something very strange still to be understood in all of this as to why an exact we've got exactly the amount of matter we have and not very much antimatter but i want to float you, you another idea one of richard feynman's and Feynman came up with his famous Feynman diagrams of particles moving through space and time and having interactions drawn as we have here as arrows and on the left hand side we have what looks like two electrons and on the right we have a positron E plus and an electron E minus and we have the arrow of time going up the diagram so space is represented horizontally time vertically and what Feynman pointed out was that these two diagrams are somewhat equivalent in the right hand diagram let's look at the right hand diagram first we perhaps had a photon of energy coming in from below forward in time up the diagram and then collided with another one and out came our particle antiparticle pair the e minus and the e plus moving away from each other and moving forward in time as a matter and antimatter pair but you can look at it another way that it what actually happened was that an electron from the future came in from the top left of the diagram on the left hand side here and hit something and rebounded forwards in time turning itself around and becoming observed as a real electron and what Feynman points out is that the antimatter equivalent of an electron a positron is exactly the same as an electron that's traveling backwards through time it has the opposite properties, the opposite electric charge, the opposite spin in terms of the quantum spin that it seems to have. This is just the mirror image 
reflected, reflecting all of those charge, parity and time quantities, turns a matter particle into an antimatter particle. And so it's been suggested, and uh, I dreamt this one up uh, independently actually, I was quite uh, taken by the idea when I saw that other people had beaten me to it, um, that perhaps what we're seeing is that we live in a universe of matter and that the Big Bang created roughly equal amounts of matter and antimatter and that in fact the antimatter separated and went off in the other time direction backwards in time quotes before unquotes the Big Bang moving in the negative time axis and that uh, the matter moved in the positive time axis away. And I think that's quite a cute idea. Now, we've still got to explain why we've got a billion times more photons than we had matter particles in terms of the energy budget of the universe. So there's more to say on this one, and this doesn't necessarily uh, answer all the questions, but it's a nice idea. So maybe there's a different explanation, which is that what we're looking at across the universe isn't all matter. Maybe there is some antimatter out there. Maybe there are anti stars or anti galaxies where regions of the universe that got separated from each other started with over densities of the other version of matter going in the opposite direction in terms of its. Uh, spin and charge and so forth. And maybe these were separated away from each other by that original Big Bang inflation and that they're just sitting out there and that when we look at them they look perfectly normal. The spectrum of the light is the same, the magnetic fields are the same, it would be very hard to tell one from another. Well, hmm, interesting. What can we possibly do to do, uh, tell the difference? Well, if they're very, very far away and separated physically from each other, I suspect the answer is not much. But we have the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope, and this has been mapping gamma ray sources from the Milky Way and beyond. You can see an artist's impression of the Fermi scope in orbit around the Earth there, and a map of the galaxy. The red is gamma ray emissions and you've got lots of little red hot spots all over the sky. Most of these are either from feeding black holes or recently fed black holes or spinning neutron stars, pulsars, which also seem to be able to accelerate um, particles to the energies needed to start creating uh, matter, antimatter positron electron pairs that then eliminate uh, annihilate as uh, 511 kilo electron volt gamma rays again so what's going on well fermi did a survey and it looked at nearly 6000 5787 gamma ray sources across the sky and eliminated all but 14 of them as being black hole black holes, quasars, pulsars, that sort of thing, things that we now think we understand pretty well. But it left 14 of them that seem to be in the Milky Way, so relatively nearby compared to most of the others, and that had the 511 kilo electron volt signature of antimatter annihilation, and were point sources. So are these, in fact, anti-stars, stars made of antimatter floating around in our Milky Way? Well, a hypothetical star made of antimatter that would look in visible light just like uh, an ordinary star would look exactly the same. Same spectrum, same energy levels in the atoms. The gravity of it would act positively. Antimatter doesn't have anti-gravity. It still has positive gravity. It still has positive energy. And so it, uh, it would create all of the same effects on objects moving around it, pulling material inwards. It would have the same charge, stirring, 
creating magnetic fields in the other direction perhaps but nevertheless you wouldn't be able to tell but it would be pulling material in and if that material were ordinary matter from the interstellar medium perhaps then it would annihilate as it made contact with the anti-star's surface the electrons would be falling in and finding their way and bumping into positrons of your anti-star and bingo 511 kilo electron volt uh, gamma rays would emerge so perhaps that is what we're seeing and statistically looking at the number of these sources that we have found across the Milky Way it's as if there's one in every 400,000 ordinary stars turn out to actually be anti-stars. It's a little bit hypothetical but what other evidence could there be? Well we have had the AMS detector a unit mounted externally on the International Space Station, there was AMS-1 and then AMS-2, looking for antimatter and it was detecting positrons and antiprotons in very large numbers and that doesn't surprise us because we know the Van Allen belts of radiation around the Earth contain quite a lot of antimatter in the form of positrons and antiprotons. They're relatively easy to generate. But it also detected anti-helium, um, including eight anti-helium-3 nuclei and a number of anti-helium-4 nuclei as well. And anti-helium is very, very difficult to account for from ordinary sources of uh, cosmic rays and so forth. It just doesn't make sense. So the only story that we can come up with is that there is some antimatter around and possibly that this is uh, the remains of stellar wind from anti-stars that has managed to make its way across the galaxy and get here. So this lends some weight to the Fermi uh, detection of those 14 candidates across the Milky Way. And those were launched, the AMS detectors were launched uh, in the last uh, 15 or so years. Um, in fact, a friend of mine wrote some of the software that went on uh, AMS2 and was counting these detections uh, using... Uh, an operating system developed in Cambridge so that was an interesting little connection but just about to be uh, producing results is GAPS the general anti-particle spectrometer and this is not a spacecraft it's a balloon and it's being launched around about uh, now from Antarctica and it's looking for antimatter in cosmic rays and it's aiming to try and confirm AMS's detection of these anti-helium nuclei because those numbers that we're talking about, just eight nuclei, isn't really a, a very large statistical sample to say the least. So it might not be right and uh, it'd be great if this can confirm it. Um, and it's looking like maybe there's more antimatter around than we thought. So that's... Uh, quite an interesting development. I hope you've enjoyed that very brief look at the hints that there might be anti-stars even in our own galaxy um, and I'll leave it there for now. Thanks for listening.